Welcome to the Red Clinic Podcast. My name is Dr. Schwalen. I'm a licensed psychologist and expert in the treatment of eating disorders. Today, I'm going to do what we do best and provide some education about eating disorders and the treatment of eating disorders. Um, for those of you out there who are struggling or have a loved one who has experienced an eating disorder, today I'm going to go over just some background. So some statistics out there so that you have an understanding of prevalence rates and kind of how many people does this really affect how early does it start? And then over the course of the next several weeks, I'm actually going to take different eating disorder diagnoses and focus in on them specifically. So today we're going to focus in on anorexia nervosa. And next week we might focus on something like bulimia or binge eating disorder. But what I will do is I will pick a different eating disorder each week and just go more in depth explaining kind of what they look like, what someone experiencing them may be going through, what family members may need to know more about them and um, how to know when it's an actual issue that needs a higher level of care or to get a professional involved. Um, So just to go into some background, um, I may have mentioned this on previous episodes, but I just think it's always good to review some of the information and keep it at the forefront of our minds so we understand just how serious eating disorders are. Um, At my clinic, we don't mess around, and I say that often. Um, There's a reason for it. You know, we know that younger and younger these days, children are um, affected by eating disorders or what we would call, you know, different kinds of subclinical thoughts or behaviors or ideas that influence just how they feel and how they think. So by age six, children actually begin to express concern about their weight and shape. Everything I'm going to share with you is based in research. It comes from different studies that have been done. And we're finding that by age six is when kids can start to have that awareness about their weight or their shape. Now, in my personal experience as a psychologist who focuses with clients on, uh, just focuses on my work with clients who have eating disorders, I've actually seen it happen as young as age five. So the research says age six, I've seen age five. But the point is it's happening for younger and younger kiddos. Um, Between 40 and 60% of girls ages six to 12 will worry about becoming fat. Now, these statistics are pulled from different studies in terms of looking at middle school, um, elementary school, and high school age um, individuals and compiling the research together. So 40 to 60% of girls in the United States worry about becoming fat. A lot of that can come from just messages that they're seeing in our culture. We know that there's this really big focus on the thin ideal as being the definition of beauty for women. We also know that boys are held to the standard of being lean or muscular, and that's what's considered attractive. And so even though girls are getting the message that maybe the thin ideal is what's beautiful for them, boys are getting the message that being lean or athletic is what's considered attractive for them. Um, And So that's one source of kind of where that comes from. We also know that families can either, you know, very outwardly or even subtly give that message that, you know, worrying about the way you look and losing weight or being thin is what's important or most accepted. When I work with families, I'll have conversations with them about subtle messages, you know, that they may be sending. Hey, mom or dad or sister, are you looking at yourself in the mirror too long? And can your little one see that? Are you taking um, quite a long time to pick out just the right outfit because you can't find the one that makes you look just right? Are you overly concerned about your weight or your shape? Um, And even if you're not explicitly talking to your child about that, Are they able to pick up on some of those concerns because of how you carry yourself throughout the day? And so just kind of thinking about that is really important. I'm not here to say that, you know, your child is going to develop an eating disorder and it's all your fault because that's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm just trying to say that we need to be aware of how these things can contribute to that mentality of the thin ideal. We know that, you know, all of us in our society are actually exposed to that thin ideal and most of us internalize it. That's very normal. It's just a part of living in the United States. We also know that 
most of us are going to have some type of body dissatisfaction. In fact, if you put 10 people in a room, nine out of 10 are going to say, I don't like my body or there's something about myself that I wish I was different. So it's actually really normal to be dissatisfied with the way you look. Unfortunately, that comes from just our society in terms of the marketing industry, right? People get paid for you to feel bad about yourself. Unfortunately, that's just what they make money off of. So if they can put out a product for your skin and make you feel that you don't have good skin, for example, you're more likely to go buy that product. Having body dissatisfaction is part of the industry that we live in. And it's, it's used, unfortunately, in that way. So when you put messages like that in front of children who are ages 6 to 12 years old, for example, even though they're not the ones in our society who have the money, right? The adults are the ones who have the money to spend. Kids still get access to that information. And so they start worrying about becoming fat as young as age 6. We also know that over half of teenage girls and about a third of teenage boys use unhealthy um, behaviors for controlling their weight. So in one study that actually surveyed high school students, and this study is really cool because it actually surveys students like every several years and updates their statistics. Um, So for this particular study, the more recent statistics are half of teenage girls and a third of teenage boys, so this is high school kids. endorsed or basically said, yes, I do these things in order to um, prevent weight gain. So what they said they do are things like skipping meals on purpose. So, you know, teenagers will go to school and they might skip lunch or skip breakfast, be in a rush, run out the door and not eat um, until maybe they get home in the afternoon. Um, They're doing things like purging. So purging is when someone might force themselves to throw up or do something else to compensate for taking in calories. Um, That could be using laxatives. It could be over-exercising or even restricting the next meal or the whole next day. So doing something to make up for the fact that they took in calories. That's what purging is. Um, They also say things like they smoke cigarettes or vape. Um, because it can suppress appetite, drink a lot of caffeine, like so coffee and tea. Um, so those are some examples of what kids in high school have said that they will do on purpose to prevent weight gain. Now, just because kids are doing those things doesn't mean that they have an eating disorder, but we know that they are engaging in some kind of unhealthy weight control behavior And we definitely want to be aware of it so that it doesn't turn into something worse. We also know that approximately one third of non-overweight girls will engage in dieting. So there's something to that, right? I mean, if you think about it, they're not actually overweight. They don't actually have weight to lose. Yet because they're so concerned about their body image and being fat or overweight, they engage in dieting. Now, um, I know in past episodes I've had some dietitians on and I've talked to other psychologists and we can go into this for a whole episode in terms of the soapbox that we can get on when it comes to diet culture. But diet mentality is a huge part of American society, right? So I think everybody all the time is always talking about weight loss, what to eat for dinner, making sure that they're not bad tonight because they were oh so bad yesterday or at lunch, you won't believe what I had. And so diet mentality is also something that people profit off of. Um, And so that's why there's a whole industry out there that wants you to go on diets, that wants to advertise things about you know, the newest fad diet like keto or intermittent fasting or um, whole food 30, you know, just the different things that are out there right now. There used to be paleo. There used to be Atkins. Um, there's, it, it always seems like it's pretty much the same kind of diet with a different name. And then people kind of jump on the bandwagon. Now, the thing about it is that when people talk about dieting, 
Um, and even Weight Watchers, that's definitely a diet mentality, right? Is restricting oneself to a certain number of calories or certain types of foods. What we know, though, is that most people will say that they're just not good at diets, that they fail every diet they've ever tried. And when we work with clients, we actually help them understand that they didn't fail the diet, the diet failed them, okay? And it was meant to fail them because if the diet worked, then the diet industry would be out of business. And so that's just something that, you know, in clinic or in education, we try to provide those critical thinking skills to people because it's really hard when you're living in it and you're a part of it to actually realize what's happening. Um, another statistic of elementary school age girls who look at social media or read magazines or have access to a lot of like pop culture types of things, um, almost 50% of them report that the images or pictures that they see make them want to lose weight. So this is girls, you know, first grade through fifth grade is what we're talking about. That just seeing images like that, whether it be, you know, like I said, on social media, Pinterest, Instagram, whatever they're looking at, 50% are affected in the way that they start that comparison, that feeling of inadequacy, that I'm not good enough because I don't look like that. And so now I'm worried about it or I'm going to start doing something to change that. All right, so I go into all of that because I want to just kind of help you all understand it's starting earlier and earlier. Um, seeds are planted, right, at elementary school age, junior high, high school. And then certain things can start happening to kiddos and we start seeing different behaviors in them. Now those behaviors can last all the way up into adulthood. So I'm not just talking to parents who have kids, but I'm also talking to adults out there who are struggling with some of this because it starts really early, but then it's not just something that goes away. It can be something that people struggle with their whole life, feeling unsatisfied, wishing their body was different, never feeling good enough. And they don't necessarily have to have an eating disorder to feel those things. There are many men and women out there today who don't actually meet criteria for an eating disorder, but struggle with some serious body dissatisfaction or shame or a sense of inadequacy, and they tie it back to the way they look. Some other things I want to talk about before we go real specifically into anorexia is the fact that eating disorders affect both girls and boys or males and females. First of all, we know that at least 30 million people of all ages and genders suffer from an eating disorder in the United States alone. We also know that about 10% of those people are male. So the fact, I mean, there's a myth out there. I don't really know. You know, some people still think that eating disorders only really affect women. And it's about 10% of individuals out there right now who have an eating disorder are male. Males are less likely to seek treatment, though, um, just because it may be seen as they're just trying to get fit to be better at their sport or um, they may be keeping it a secret because they could also be struggling with trauma or sexuality issues, and they're not ready to talk about any of it. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why males are much less likely to seek treatment, and so we may also not even have accurate numbers. It could be more males than we even realize have eating disorders, but we just don't see them in treatment, and so it's hard to count them. We also know that eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. This is why, you know, at my clinic, we don't mess around. I've done episodes in the past of like, hey, if your treatment team is telling you that outpatient is not appropriate, there are really good reasons for it. When we're scared that someone's life is at risk, we're not going to keep that a secret. We're going to let everybody know 
that, hey, we're in, we're in a danger zone right now and we need to follow recommendations, even if those recommendations are scary. Because the outcome of not following recommendations is even scarier. So when I say eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness, this is specifically true for adolescent females who have anorexia. And then it's true for other age ranges and other disorders as well. But I want, I just want to like drive that home a little bit in terms of, when I say other disorders, I mean other types of eating disorders. So in terms of eating disorders, having the highest mortality rate, I'm talking about even higher than individuals with depression and suicidal ideation. I'm talking about even higher than individuals with schizophrenia who may be actively hallucinating and hearing voices that tell them to do scary things. So that, you know, that to me is really, really important. And that's why I spend so much time on it because I don't want to make light of the fact that there are people who die from side effects related to having an eating disorder. Now, another really important thing that I like to tell people is that we know from research that most eating disorders begin at two different times in life. Now, this is just a generalization, so keep in mind that there's always the outlier. There's always the anomaly. We can see eating disorders much younger. We can see eating disorders start much older. But for the most part, we see that eating disorders really have an onset or a starting point around adolescence, usually when someone is about to start puberty, and then again in college. Now, keep in mind, people can be diagnosed with eating disorders as young as five and six years old. But for the most part, like for anorexia, for example, in general, we see around puberty and around college. Now, the thing about these two times in life is that in adolescence, that's really a time of identity forming. It's a time of social exploration and development of friendships and really figuring out who someone is and and kind of what they're all about as they start to individuate from their parents and really just become their own person. And so for a lot of individuals, especially if there's like a trauma or some other kind of anxiety or depression that's at play, it can be very hard to navigate successful puberty or successful journey into adolescence. And so it's already rough enough, right? I mean, if you remember all the adults out there, what it was like to be a teenager, you know it's a tough time. And for those of you who are teenagers, you're going through it right now, it's a really challenging, awkward time in life. And eating disorders definitely have an opportunity to pounce during this time. This is when a lot of individuals are very vulnerable because of all the stress they're going through. Um, Just given that it's this developmental stage in life, and then like I said, especially if there's other things going on also, like anxiety, depression, or some kind of trauma that happens. The other time is college. Again, for a lot of the same reasons. Going off to college for a lot of people is a time for identity formation, socially trying to figure out their status and where they stand and kind of how to navigate that realm. It's also a time of huge shift and can be highly stressful. So for a lot of people, this is the first time they've ever lived away from home. For a lot of people, it's the first time they've ever had to be responsible for their own, you know, life, basically doing schoolwork, turning it in on time, getting to class, um, managing their own schedule and routine, uh, taking care of themselves. So getting enough to eat, navigating meals in a cafeteria, maybe, or ordering takeout, different things that just pop up that maybe they've never had that much freedom over or reason to ever have to do for themselves. And now they're kind of thrown in, they're having to navigate it all on their own, and this is another time when eating disorders can really pounce. Again, it's a vulnerable time, and it's a time when someone might have more room for that eating disorder to come in. 
A few other things that I just want to put out there before we talk specifically about anorexia. Uh, Research shows that about every hour, so it's very specific, actually every 62 minutes, at least one person dies as a direct result from an eating disorder. Eating disorders affect all races and ethnic groups. And so I say that, you know, one of my favorite ways of saying that is we know that eating disorders don't discriminate. I've already gone into the fact that they affect males and females. They affect all races, all ethnicities. They affect anyone from any kind of socioeconomic background, no matter what kind of resources someone has. um, Anyone can be vulnerable to developing an eating disorder. And so because we know that, I mean, we've obviously studied like different genetic factors and different psychological and social influences. We kind of have theories out there of, you know, what kind of causes that perfect storm, but we also see that those individuals that are diagnosed with eating disorders, there's nothing unique about their background in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic status. We also know that the highest risk for a full relapse is between four and 16 months with relapse rates of 35 to 41%. So, I mean, that's almost half of the clients that come out of a higher level of care. So let's say they were hospitalized for an eating disorder. Now they come out of that hospitalization. It's, it's 35 to 41, so maybe it's not as high as half. I exaggerated that, but it's, it's high. It's still high. It's higher than I would like to see. So it's about a third of those clients are going to turn, turn around at some point and go back into the hospital. So that's what relapse means from this study. And... Because of that, at the Red Clinic, we let our clients know that, hey, according to different statistics and research and different theories like stages of change and things like that, we know that to set you up for true recovery, we're in this for the long haul. We're going to be together for at least the next six months, if not a year or sometimes longer to just make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure the eating disorder is truly something that's under your control and you feel like you're in true recovery and true recovery at the red clinic really means, you know, achieving, achieving your goals, uh, realizing your values, um, obtaining an idea of who your authentic self is right apart from that eating disorder. And so that's actually really cool work that we get to do. Um, All right, so I'm going to jump into just specifics about anorexia nervosa to provide education on what that specific eating disorder looks like. And then next week, I'll probably talk about bulimia or some other kind of eating disorder. So if we're looking like from a diagnostic standpoint, anorexia is diagnosed if someone is restricting caloric intake or energy intake. That's kind of like the very official way of saying that relative to what is required. So essentially, they're not eating enough, right? They're restricting their calories. um, And they're not getting what they need, right, based on some kind of metric. And usually that metric is, okay, like, let's look at growth charts. Let's look at, you know, people of your sex, age, and height, or developmental trajectory, right? Like where should you fall and where are you falling on that growth curve? Um, It's also defined as a significantly low weight for that individual based on those metrics. So it's gonna be less than what's expected, even what's minimally expected. So being extremely malnourished and underweight is a part of the diagnostic criteria of anorexia. Someone with anorexia also like pretty much the hallmark of this diagnosis is that they're going to have an intense fear of gaining weight. Now, as a clinician, I speak to individuals with anorexia all the time, right? Cause that's my specialty. I treat eating disorders And when I'm talking to people about this, I'll ask the question, are you afraid of gaining weight versus were you trying to lose weight? And that sounds so slight, but it's a big difference to someone who has anorexia because a lot of times they weren't really trying to lose weight and get to the point where they needed treatment. They were just afraid of gaining weight or of becoming fat. 
And so it's a nuance, right, in the way you ask the question or even think about that. But sometimes it can make a difference in how they answer that question. Now, because of that fear of becoming fat or gaining weight, there is persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain. So for someone, even if they're at a significantly low weight, they continue to fear weight gain and they're going to continue to do whatever they can to interfere with it until the point of becoming so malnourished that they may need hospitalization or they may end up in very bad shape and need tube feedings or fluids or weeks and or months in a hospital setting. Now, someone with anorexia is also going to have a disturbance in the way that they view their body shape or weight. So even if they are significantly below the weight that they need to be, they're going to continue to interfere with weight gain. And when I say continue to interfere with that, I've already said they're not getting enough calories, but then they're also going to be doing other things like maybe they're exercising or maybe they're, um, you know, they could be using laxatives or purging. There's still some of that that goes on with anorexia. And I'll get into that in a minute. But although anyone else who looks at them would say, you know, you're not overweight by any means, like that's not what we see when we look at you. The person is going to experience themselves as overweight, not thin, not underweight. Um, There's going to definitely be a distorted view of self and an obsession with food, with the way they look, with thinking about burning calories, with preoccupation of having fat on their body, um, associating exercise with weight loss. Wait a second, doesn't almost everybody do that? Uh, The reason I bring that up is because one thing that we have to work very hard at with all of our clients is like debunking what society wants us to think. And over the course of the of this episode, I've explained there's diet culture, there's the thin ideal, there's this whole mentality in our society. And part of that is also associating exercise with weight loss. You want to lose weight, exercise more. You go to the doctor, he says, eat better, exercise more, control your weight, con- you know, get, in to- get on top of all of that. And so we like to think about moving our bodies and finding joy in that right? So we call that joyful movement. That's a different model of care. We talk about quality of life. Hey, exercise doesn't have to be a form of punishment. It doesn't have to always be associated with burning calories. Have you ever just done something because you had fun doing it? A lot of kids, you know, or adults will say, well, I used to, I used to dance or I used to play sports or go for a swim. And then it turned into, I can't, I can't do any of those things because those don't burn enough calories. I just need to go do cardio or, or whatever it is. And now they're not really having fun or enjoying life anymore. So we look at that. We look to see how serious the body distortions are, or the cognitive distortions. We, we, those, those phrases are interchangeable. We know that they see themselves as much more distorted than we would if we were looking at that same person and that they have this absolute fear of becoming fat. Now, there's two types of anorexia, um, so we specify what are those two types. The first type is anorexia restricting type, and that's really, you know, kind of what it sounds like is they're, they're not binge eating, they're not purging, they're just restricting. So there's a lot of skipping meals, there's a lot of fasting, there's a lot of calorie counting, um, even if, you know, so... Just for example, I mean, just recently I did an assessment and the person told me they don't allow themselves to eat more than 500 calories a day. Um, I've heard 100 calories a day. You know, just to give you some context, 100 calories a day is like eating a banana and that's it all day long. 500 would be eating five bananas all day and that's all you get the whole day, okay? Um, and have and being very controlled, over control is usually something we see with individuals who have anorexia. If we're talking about personality traits, having over control actually serves them well in other parts of life, and I'll get into that in a second. But um, there's no induced vomiting, there's no purging, there's no binging. It's just all restricting. And then there can be things like excessive exercise. 
So it's like someone who goes on a diet because they're eating less and they're starting some workouts, but they never stop. The other type of anorexia is binge eating purging type. Now, this is confusing for a lot of people because it's hard for them to wrap their head around like, oh, I just thought anorexia meant you didn't eat. Um, didn't, most people don't realize that there can be binge and purge behaviors associated with anorexia. So pretty much all of it is still there. There's this, you know, low body weight. There's a fear of weight gain. There's body image problems, the distorted view of self. Um, but the person is, is engaging in some kind of binge eating or purging behaviors throughout the process of also restricting. And so that can look like, you know, restricting for several days in a row and then maybe one night binge eating um, and then the next few days restricting again. It can look like eating, uh, having a binge episode and then immediately going and purging it and then for the next several days restricting. But usually there's more restriction going on than binge purge behaviors and so it still meets criteria for anorexia. Now, I mentioned that individuals with anorexia tend to have certain uh, personality traits. And so this is, again, it's a generalization. Everybody's different. And so when I meet a client, I'm going to say, well, tell me about you specifically or your experience of your symptoms. Because even with things like anxiety and depression, I'll say, well, what's your anxiety like? Or what does your depression feel like? How do you know when you're depressed? Because it's different for everybody. So in general... If someone has anorexia, we also know that they can typically be more of a type A personality. So what I mean by that, I kind of alluded to it, you know, individuals can be over-controlled in some sense, and it can serve them well in other areas of life. They are typically high achievers. They typically get really good grades, or they're very high performing at their jobs. They're organized. They plan ahead. Uh, they, they appreciate, you know, knowing the logistics of things and thinking through the details, um, they can be perfectionistic at times. Um, and so none of these are necessarily a bad thing. In fact, having qualities like that can really be associated with a lot of success in life. You know, people can argue that. In treatment, when an eating disorder manipulates those qualities, and now, you know, that perfectionism turns into this extreme drive for thinness. Um, the type A, you know, hitting things exactly the way they need to be turns into calorie counting, not letting them go, not letting themselves go above or under that and being on target, you know, all the time thinking about food, knowing every little bit of exercise they did and not thinking about anything else except whatever their eating disorder is forcing them to think about. Um, working so hard that they exhaust themselves and burn out, you know, so what we do in treatment once the body is refed and they've been nutritionally rehabilitated, we start working with them to really understand like, hey, these qualities are actually, they can be used as strengths if you learn how to channel them in a healthy way. And learning how to engage in self-care and learning how to take a break and understand like, oh man, my perfectionism is really taking over right now and stepping away from that and balancing it with more realistic standards that's the stuff we work on with the client once they're ready for outpatient. Now, the other thing I want to mention before I end today is there are a lot of medical complications associated with anorexia. And so this is one reason why I want to just really put out there that if you think someone's struggling with it or you're worried about it or you know someone's struggling with it, go ahead and encourage them to get help or get them in front of the, a doctor somehow, some way. Take, that, take your child to the ER if you believe something is going on with them um, because malnutrition can lead to so many other things in a child's or adult life, anyone really who's malnourished. There can be organ failures. There can be heart issues. Um, there can be vitamin deficiencies. You know, all these things are very, very serious when they get to a certain point. And unfortunately, there are individuals who die from anorexia because of the um, complications associated with being malnourished or dehydrated. And so again, I just want to put it out there that if um, you believe that someone is, is ill and they're skipping a lot of meals or they've gone too long without eating or drinking, 
just take them to the ER and get them checked out. Um, so that's it for right now. I want to um, uh, just kind of recap. I went over anorexia today. Next week, I'll go over a different kind of eating disorder. Not sure yet. I'll, I'll figure it out here in a little bit, I'm sure. Um, and for the next few weeks, I'm just going to go over in depth just different diagnoses, what they mean, what they look like, and what to look for. Um, and so that's it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see you next week.